Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to this evening's study. And uh, we are going to continue studying um, the book, uh, E.J. Wagner's Response to the Law in Galatians by Butler. Uh, But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all that you do in our lives. We're thankful for the things that you have created, the people that you have brought into our lives, and uh, the opportunity to be of service to others and to minister to those around us and to be ministered to. And we just invite your spirit to speak to each heart who is studying these things. Help us, Lord, to learn of you, of your meekness and lowliness, and help us to trust in you in spite of what we see around us. We ask that we can have faith, a faith that can trust in you no matter what. And we just pray, Lord, that as we study your word, that our faith can grow and increase. And um, we pray, Lord, that it will that you can strengthen us to give a message to the world. That, that, you, that it can be seen that we've been with Jesus. And so we ask this and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone, again. And originally had my marker one paragraph lower, but I'm going to read this paragraph before. So just kind of as, as a review, we, we've done a lot in looking at righteousness by faith in connection with the three angels' messages. So one of the things we know is that all of the angels' messages, because of the everlasting gospel, are all part of the message of righteousness by faith. It's not just the third angel's message. The third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, that is in reality, in the life, right? So that's sort of the the fruit of righteousness by faith is expressed in the third angel's message. And we know that there was this controversy in 1888, of course, over the law in Galatians. And when you read about it in most Adventist book, it's more a kind of a dry issue about, you know, who is right and who is wrong. And, you know, it was really both, you know, it's both the the ceremonial and the moral law. But people don't really look at the implications of what was being discussed because it really wasn't about the law in Galatians. It was about the nature of Christ. It was about righteousness by faith. And um, so we went through some of Butler's book, but we can see that that Wagner, uh, when he's going through Butler's book, he's doing it nice. He's, He's representing Butler correctly, and then he's addressing the points that Butler brings out. So we don't really need to read Butler's book. We can just read Wagner's. Um, but if a person wants to, they can read Butler's book. But we went through some of it ourselves, analyzed it, and then we looked at what Wagner was doing, and he was doing some of the same analysis. So it just makes sense to continue reading on here. So we finished off uh, last week. We had read uh, this paragraph, and we're going to read it again. Um, so they're discussing uh, the idea about uh, the law, so that Butler is saying, well, the law is just the ceremonial law. And he's talking about the council in Acts. And um, so the council there, according to um, G.I. Butler, was just addressing issues of the ceremonial law, not the moral law. And Wagner showing that that's not really the case. So he says, do you really believe that the, the council took no cognizance of the Ten Commandments? If so, can you tell me of what law fornication is the transgression? Fornication is one of the four things forbidden by the council. Now, I have a very distinct recollection of some plain talk which you gave on this subject at the general conference and of some still plainer testimony from Sister White, all of which I thought was very pertinent. You prove from scripture that the seventh commandment may be broken by even a look or a desire of the heart. And yet you claim that the council which forbade fornication took no cognizance whatever of the Ten Commandments. How you can make such a statement after reading the 15th chapter of Acts is beyond my comprehension. Again, another thing which was forbidden by the council was pollution, pollutions of idols. That certainly must have some connection with the first and second commandments. 
uh, to say nothing of other commandments that were broken in idolatrous feasts. I should be extremely sorry to have people get the idea that, that we do not regard pollutions of idols or fornication as violations of the moral law. You claim that it is the ceremonial law alone that was under consideration in that council. Will you please cite me to that portion of the ceremonial law which forbids fornication and idolatry? This is an important matter. And right here, your whole argument falls to the ground. You very properly connect the book of Galatians with the 15th, chap- 15th chapter of Acts. You justly claim that in Galatians, Paul pursues the same line of argument which was pursued in the council. And you depend on the assumption that the council took no cognizance of the moral law in order to prove that the moral law does not come into the account in Galatians. But a simple reading of the report of the council shows that the moral law did come in there. And therefore, according to your own argument, the moral law must be considered in the book of Galatians. Take for a moment the supposition that the ceremonial law alone was considered by the council. Then it necessarily follows, as is plainly stated in the two laws on page 31, that the council decided that four points of the ceremonial law were declared to be binding on Christians. Now, let me ask, is the decision of that council as binding on us as it was on the primitive Christians? If so, then the ceremonial law was not taken away at the cross, and we are still subject to it. If the ceremonial law was a yoke of bondage, and that council decreed that a part of it was to be observed by Christians, did they not mere, thereby deliberately place Christians under a yoke of bondage in spite of Peter's emphatic protest against putting a yoke on, upon them? And if those four necessary things were part of the ceremonial law, and were binding 21 years after the crucifixion, when, if ever, did they cease to be in force? We have no record of those four necessary things enjoined by the Council of Jerusalem were part of the ceremonial law, thereby denies that the ceremonial law ceased at the cross. I cannot think that you would have taken the position which you have if you had taken time to carefully consider this matter. And let me state in brief what I regard as the truth concerning the Council at Jerusalem. And we're going to look at this ourselves in a little bit of detail. Uh, Certain ones came down to Antioch and taught the brethren that they were not, that if they were not circumcised, they could not be saved. These persons or others of the same class had greatly troubled all the churches that Paul had raised up. The Galatians among the rest. These men who taught thus were not Christians indeed, but were false brethren. See Galatians 2, 4. As a consequence of this teaching, many were being turned away from the gospel. In trusting to circumcision for justification, they were leaning on a broken reed which could profit them nothing. Instead of gaining righteousness by it, they were insensibly being led into wicked practices. For without faith in Christ, no man can live a righteous life. Suppose now that the council had confirmed the teachings of these false false brethren and had decreed that circumcision was necessary to justification. What would have been the result? Just this. They would have turned the disciples away from Christ. For the only object in coming to Christ is to receive justification or pardon. And if people can get it without coming to Christ, of course, they have no need of him. But whatever the apostles might have decreed, it would still have remained a fact that circumcision is nothing, that the disciples could no more be justified by circumcision than would they um, justified by it than they could by snapping their fingers. Therefore, if they had been led to put their trust in circumcision, they would have rested satisfied in their sins and to lead them to do that which indeed um have been to do that would indeed have been to put a yoke upon them sin is a bondage and to teach men to put their trust in a false hope which will cause them to rest satisfied in their sins thinking that they are free from them is simply to fasten them in bondage now this of course is this is why this is an important topic understanding the law in galatians because 
obviously, if you have an idea that, that Butler has, that what is simply being talked about is the ceremonial law. There's a number of problems. One, of course, then why it, it, it's as if the Jews have to keep the ceremonial law, but the Gentiles don't. Right? I mean, that's sort of would be the idea. The idea is that circumcision is nothing for everyone. That is circumcision is symbolizing something after Christ has come. That and, and what is it symbolizing? Because we know that circumcision is a symbol of, of the covenant that God made with Abraham. So why is circumcision ended? Let's ask that question. W- what is Paul's argument? Why are they ending circumcision? Because people want, want the, the Galatians to be circumcised. Paul says, if you're circumcised, then you, you've basically rejected the gospel. You're, you're trying to be saved by righteousness by works but why has that changed any thoughts on that isn't that an outward symbol rather than an inward symbol okay so so it's an outward symbol but it's a symbol given by god right and and he's given different symbols at different times right so what is it about that symbol that is changed by christ coming and dying for our sins because it's a sign or a seal of righteousness by faith, like not trusting in the flesh. It's, it's come to be trusting in the flesh, but, uh, but it's not just that it's been perverted, that it's to be done away. If you understand what I'm saying, like it's, it's not just that it was misused that we aren't to be circumcised. Not that there's anything wrong with circ, because Paul says circumcision is, Nothing, neither uncircumcision, right? It's whether you're circumcised or not, it makes no difference, is what he says. So, like, you could have people think, well, you know, if circumcision is bad, then it's good to be uncircumcised. But Paul says that doesn't really matter. It, it doesn't mean anything. Okay. And any more thoughts on that? So we know it's in its out, outward sign. So is the Sabbath. Okay. I'm going to read Acts 15 here. You know, even though he's going to go through it, I just want to read it at, in in uh, this this whole thing all at once. And um, here, I should bring it up, I guess, on this. You can see it. It's not coming up properly. Just hang on. Well, I'll start reading it here on this other computer. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses. He cannot be saved. So, I mean, this this would have been true in the past. I mean, that circumcision was good. When, therefore, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So I'll bring this up here. And being brought on their way by, by the church... They passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the convert, con, conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, so these are Christians, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, uh, Peter arose <clears throat> and said unto the men and brethren, Ye know that a good while ago God made a choice among us, that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. 
And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take them out of the people, out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue or the remnant of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, said the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and th- from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him been read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Okay, so <clears throat> so let's think about it a little bit first on our own before we go further here. So, so we have these Jews. So Jews have been using circumcision. And the idea is that they want them to become Jews. Right? That, that would be the idea. Because... Normally what you would have is, is if a Gentile wanted to become a Jew, right? They would call the proselyte and, and they could become Jews. And the idea here is that they're wanting the Christians or the Gentiles who aren't Jews to become Jews, saying, you need to be circumcised and become a Jew. Now what's the yoke that neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So that's verse 10. What would that yoke be? Wouldn't that be the law? Okay, law, which law? The actual law. Go ahead, William. I was going to say ceremonial law. Okay. What were you going to say, Dwight? I wasn't going to go to the ceremonial law. Okay. Because it definitely can't be the ceremonial. Because that's not a yoke. Okay, so what would it be? What law? What was the yoke that they were not able to bear? I would have been thinking the actual law. The Ten Commandments. Correct. Okay. So, so to put that yak, he says, uh, the yoke on the neck. Not the yak. Um, now, therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? So this would be the law, the Ten Commandments, right? Right. Right. Wouldn't be the ceremonial law. But that's not a yoke. I'm just trying to see if I can find. Yeah, so I'm just looking at these. Okay, so they got some in Galatians. Those aren't going to help us. But but here's one uh, that the translators give as a reference. It's Hebrews 9, uh, verse uh, 9, verse 9. It says, and and I'm just going to read a little bit ahead of it. Uh, It's talking about uh, the tabernacle, right? So you got the the first compartment and the second compartment. And then in verse six, he says, now these, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, or the Holy Ghost is signifying this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now, it shouldn't hear where it says holiest of all. This would not be the most holy place. So this is just the way into the sanctuary was not yet made manifest. So King James, I'm not sure why they translated that way. Anyway, um, which was a figure For the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, which could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So we have the earthly sanctuary. Can people... In the earthly sanctuary service, we have these offerings made for sin, right? Correct. Okay. 
Now, these were a figure or a type. But now that the type has come, we need to recognize that they were fulfilled and and they couldn't do something. They couldn't make those that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. That is, there was still a conscience of sins, right? They still were aware of their sins, right? Their, their, Their sins are not being removed. And the gospel is to remove our sins, right? So now when we think about the ceremonial law, what, what do we think the ceremonial law is? Isn't it the sacrifices? Yeah. So so mostly it's the sacrifices because these are ceremonies that are done that point forward to Christ. Now, are these going to be imposed upon the people in Acts chapter 15? In, are they going to be asked to do sacrifices? Is that what the uh, the Judaizers want? What is it that they're asking? They want them to be circumcised. Okay, so so the circumcision. It, I mean, in a sense, you could say it's part of the ceremonial law, but it's it's not really. I mean, because it is a ceremony, you get circumcised, but it, it's it's not part of the types that point to the sacrifice of Christ. It's it's a sign of the covenant, right? And that covenant, when it's given to Abraham, is there the sanctuary, right? This is before Moses, right? That, that circumcision is given. So, so what are the Judaizers asking when they're, they're looking to circumcision? Because, I mean, it's definitely not about the sacrifices. So if we think about the fact that the yoke is the, the law of God, what what are they doing with circumcision? What is circumcision not being able to do? Right? So it can't be about the sacrifices because, you know, the sanctuary. I mean, obviously, Abraham did sacrifices. But it's not about the whole sacri- the sanctuary system, services, because those didn't exist when Abraham was given the sign of the covenant. So one thing we know is that this has to be the Ten Commandments that being, that's being talked about, not the ceremonial law. Whatever that specifically would be definitely is not what the Judaizers are asking. They're not asking people to do sacrifices, but they're asking them to trust in something that is now fulfilled. It's, 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 um, it's passed away. We're in the time of reformation. And so does it make sense to continue circumcision after we have baptism? Because what's the difference between circumcision and baptism? Baptism, you become a new creature. Okay, so you got circumcision, it's not trusting in the flesh. It's a sign that you don't trust in the flesh. But with baptism, we have both the death, the burial, well, not both, all three, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ all being symbolized. And it's all about, if if we look in uh, Romans chapter 6, Right. So in Romans chapter six, when we look at about uh, verse three, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Right. So the whole idea is in verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. So with circumcision, it's pointing forward to something, and baptism is pointing backward to something. But that makes sense. So by by looking at circumcision, just thinking about the fact of being a Jew, um, it actually is a type of trusting in the flesh. Because I'm the seed of Abraham, I'm going to be saved. And then, other people, if they want to be saved, they need to also have that sign. 
But there's a different sign that's been given, which is baptism. It replaces circumcision. Okay, so let's go back to um, what he says. It, would it would it be like be like Seven Day Adventists being like they got their names in the books? Yeah, it's just trusting in the fact that you're you know that you're circumcised that that's yeah. going to save you. And and you could do the same thing with baptism, but baptism as a symbol is about walking in new, newness of life. It's about a transformation of character. And that wasn't part of circumcision, right? It was just a sign of a covenant. So there's 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 a difference between circumcision and baptism. Okay, so let's go back here. We'll see what Wagner says about this. Peter said, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now, the fathers had the ceremonial law and did bear it. They practiced it and throve under it. As David said, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age and they shall be fat and flourishing. Anyone who reads the Psalms will see that David did not regard the ceremonial law as a burdensome yoke or think it grievous bondage to carry out its ordinances. It was a delight to him to offer the sacrifices of thanksgiving because by it he showed faith in Christ. Faith in Christ was the soul and life of his service. Without that, his worship would have been a meaningless form. But if he had been so ill-informed as to suppose that the simple mechanical performance of the ceremonial law would cleanse him from sin, then indeed he, it, he would have been in a grievous condition. There are two yokes, the yoke of sin, Satan's yoke, and the yoke of Christ. The yoke of sin is hard to bear, right? Satan is a hard master, but the yoke of Christ is easy and his burden is light. He sets us free from sin that we may serve him by bearing his mild yoke. So we can see that the yoke and the yoke of sin and the yoke of Christ, so Satan's yoke and Christ's yoke, we can see that they're both based upon the law. So the, the law can be a yoke of bondage or it can be a yoke of freedom. Right? Yeah. It's the same law. Agreed. Yes. Now, what was the reason that only four things were enjoined upon these troubled converts? It was because these four things covered the danger. Compliance with Jewish ceremonies as a mean of, means of justification separated them from Christ and naturally led them to look with favor upon heathen ceremonies. They were told that no Jewish ceremonies, whatever, were required of them. And then were cautioned against the four things in which there was the greatest danger for them. If the converts from among the Gentiles should begin to backslide, fornication and the eating of blood would be the first things they would take up because those were so common among the Gentiles that they were not considered sinful at all. Thus we see that while in the council at Jerusalem, the ceremonial law was under consideration, and the question was whether or not Christians should observe it, the only importance that, it, that attached to it, and the only reason why those who taught circumcision were reproved, was because such teaching necessarily led to the violation of the moral law, and this is the sum of the teaching in the book of Galatians. Paul emphatically warns the Galatians against being circumcised, not because circumcision was in itself so heinous a thing or heinous, for he himself had circumcised Timothy and that too after the council of Jerusalem, but because they were trusting in circumcision for justification, thus cutting loose from Christ and relapsing into idolatry. He says, I pass page 33. Uh, to your closing remarks in the second chapter where you say, right, because remember he's writing to Butler, uh, we have had here nearly two entire chapters in this letter, about one third of the whole epistle, and hitherto we have not had a single reference to the moral law, but through it all constant reference is made to the other law, that of Moses. So that's what Butler had said. <clears throat> Wagner says, I think you could not have had in mind the 19th verse of the second chapter when you wrote the above. The verse reads, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. The ceremonial law never had power to slay anyone. But even allowing that it did once have that power, 
It had itself died, having been nailed to the cross at least three years before Paul was converted. Now I ask, how could Paul be slain by a law that for three years had had no existence? This verse shows upon the face of it that the moral law is referred to. It is the same law to which Paul refers when he says, I was alive without the law once, but the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death, Romans 7, verse 9 and 10. The limits of a brief review do not allow me to give an exposition of these references to the law in the second chapter of Galatians, as I hope to do sometime. But it needs very little space to show that the moral law and no other law is referred to in Galatians 2.19. And, and you can see the point that uh, the ceremonial law doesn't have the ability to put you to death. It has no death penalty attached to it in that sense. It's the moral law that does. And, and anything that would have to do with death would be just because of its connection to the moral law. Because the moral law exists within the ceremonial law. Right. That is, uh, there's principles that come from the moral law that are applying to the ceremonial law. Because you can't have one without the other. Yes. Right. So so they are tied together. And see, Ellen White makes a statement that the law in Galatians contains both the moral and ceremonial law. And some people take that as, oh, Wagner and Jones were wrong. You know, it's somewhere in between. But that's actually not what she's saying. She's not so much saying that that. um the ceremonial law is part of the moral law, and so that they should have just talked about both laws. But she's just trying to say that even if you say it's the ceremonial law, it's the moral aspects in the ceremonial law that are really being referred to in Galatians, if that makes sense. Right? That is, it's, it's impossible to talk of the ceremonial law without talking of the moral law, because the ceremonial law on its own has no power. The power comes from the moral law. I don't, I don't know the best way to explain it, but, um, now there's a couple of other points here, uh, just kind of minor ones, because he talks about how the, the, the law had been nailed to the cross, the ceremonial law. And that's not really true. Uh, what was nailed to the cross was our sins were nailed to the cross. Now in some ways we could say that the ceremonial law was in that um, Christ fulfilled that law when he died on the cross. But when the Bible talks about, uh, you know, the written bond of our sin and the written record of our sin being nailed to the cross, that's what, that's our sins that are nailed to the cross. And in that sense, it is, is somewhat the moral law as well. But the law is done away at the cross. But with, without the moral law, Christ couldn't have died, right? Because he died because of our transgression of the moral law, not our transgression of the ceremonial law. So Wagner goes on, I see you apply Galatians 3.10 to the ceremonial law. In so doing, you certainly are taking a new position. I think I've read every book published by Seventh-day Adventists, and I've never read that position in any of them. On the contrary, everyone who has written upon this subject has applied this to the moral law, and I do not see how there is any chance to apply it anywhere else. I do not question the statement that the book of the law included both the moral and ceremonial law. So remember, you know, what, what people try to bring up about Wagner is that, um, and, and Jones is that they were just, they were just focused upon the, it, the law in Galatians is the moral law. But he understands that these two are, are together, right? So it's not like he's, he's ignorant of that. And Ellen White points out the same point. Now, I'm just going to read Galatians 3.10. It says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, is cursed is everyone that continue with not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Right. So we know that the works of the law there have to do with the ceremonial law. And, and so I'm going to go and read here. He says, I do not question the statement that the book of the law included both moral and ceremonial law. And I'm glad that you admit as much. For many who have talked or written on this subject have seemed to claim that the book of the law refers exclusively to the ceremonial law. And you will notice, however, that the book of Deuteronomy is devoted almost entirely to moral precepts and has only one or two references to the ceremonial law. And those references are in the three annual feasts. 
the antitype of one of which is still in the future. That the moral law occupies the chief place in the book of Deuteronomy must be patent to everyone who carefully reads that book. So he says, see chapter this and that, but it doesn't really matter here. Uh, chapter 6, verse 25 is universally used by Seventh-day Adventists concerning the moral law. And many other verses uh, than these, which I have selected at random. Deuteronomy 29, 29 certainly applies to the moral law. And the expression there used in the last clause implies that the moral law is the prominent law under consideration in the book. And in Deuteronomy 27, where the curses are found, uh, the 26th verse of which is quoted in Galatians 3.10, only the moral law is referred to. Right. So 3.10 is for many as are. That's what is cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Right. So he quotes that and the context is the moral law. But while it is doubtless true that the ceremonial law was included in the book of the law, I have yet to find scripture proof for the statement that there was any curse pronounced for non-performance of the ceremonial law as an brother, independent law. I'm sorry, Brother Theodore. What? Uh, did you, he said Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Yeah, Deuteronomy 29, 29. That's what he said. Well, ain't that, do, ain't that where the secret things belong to the Lord thy God? But those things which are revealed uh, belongeth unto us and to our children forever. Yeah, that we may do all the words of this law. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. And, and if you go back to like 27, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it the curses that are written in this book. Right. So, all right. So this is Deuteronomy, which is, is all about the moral law. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That the curse of the law is death, I do not suppose you will deny, and therefore you will not stop here to offer extended proof. Yet, um, and therefore will not stop here to offer extended proof. Yet, a few words may not be out of place. I simply note the point, following points: the curse of the law is what Christ bore for us. See Galatians three thirteen, and this curse consisted of being hanged on a tree. And see the last part of the same verse. This uh, being hanged on a tree was the crucifixion of Christ, for at no other time was he ever hanged on a tree. And Peter said to the wicked Jews, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree, Acts 5.30. Therefore, death is the curse which Christ bore for us. But death is the wages of sin, and sin is the violation of the moral law. Therefore, Christ bore the curse of the moral law for us. There is no other law that has any curse attached to it. Certain it is that no curse is or can be pronounced except for sin. Therefore, if the curse be pronounced for failure to comply with the rights of the ceremonial law, then such failure must be in itself sin. And therefore, the ceremonial law is also a standard of righteousness. I do not see how from your position you can avoid the conclusion that the moral law is not or at least was not in the Jewish age, of itself a perfect standard of righteousness. The great fault, which I find with the position you hold, is that it depreciates it depreciates the moral law and correspondingly depreciates the gospel. Let me repeat the argument. If the curse attaches to the ceremonial law, then violation of the ceremonial law is sin. And if violation of the ceremonial law is sin, then there is sin not forbidden by the Ten Commandments. And then the Ten Commandments are not a perfect rule of action. Moreover, since the ceremonial law is done away, it follows that the standard of righteousness is not so perfect now as it was in the days of Moses. If this is not a legitimate conclusion from your premises, I must confess my ignorance of logic. Another point, no sin can remove itself. Neither can it be atoned for by any subsequent good deed. So then, there must be some scheme of atonement for sin. Now, if sin were imputed for neglect of the ceremonial law, what remedy was provided for that sin? The ceremonial law was simply the ordinances of the gospel. If condemned sinners were still further condemned by the very remedy provided for their salvation, 
then indeed it must have been a yoke. A man is in a truly pitiable condition when the remedy given him for a sore disease only aggravates that disease. And that's really the point of all these offerings and sacrifices. They're pointing forward to a savior. They're, they're pointing forward to the gospel. They themselves cannot save you, but they are not moral laws. It's because of the moral law that, that we have the ceremonial law, because man could not keep it. Right? So they're pointing forward to a savior. Once Christ comes, there's no need for a ceremonial law. So in, in, in dealing with the law in Galatians, you'll see this more as we go through this. But um, I remember when I was first an Adventist and, and arguing this point, because I believe that what the church was telling me, that the, that the law in Galatians, no longer under the law, but we're under grace, would be the ceremonial law. But I kept running into problems. And, the, and these are the types of problems I ran into. Um, <clears throat> anyway, let's go on. It says, but you will say, and correctly so, that those who refused to comply with the requirements of the ceremonial law were put to death. Why was this? If the curse did not attach to the ceremonial law, I will answer, the violator of the moral law justly merited death, but God had provided a pardon for all who would accept it. His pardon was on condition of faith in Christ, and it was ordained that faith in Christ should be manifested through the rites of the ceremonial law. Now, if a man repented of his sins and had faith in Christ, he would manifest it and would receive the pardon. And then, of course, the penalty, penalty would not be inflicted upon him. But if he had no faith in Christ, he would not comply with the conditions of pardon. And then, of course, the penalty for sin would be inflicted. The penalty was not for failure to carry out the rites of the ceremonial law, but for the sin which might have been remitted had he manifested faith. I think anybody can see the truthfulness of this position. Let us illustrate it. Here's a man who has committed a murder and is under the sentence of death. And he is told that the governor will pardon him if he will acknowledge his guilt, repent of his sin, and make an application for pardon. But this he refuses to do. And the law is allowed to take its course and he is hanged. Now, why is he hanged? Is it because he refuses to make the application for pardon? Not by any means. He is hanged for the murder. No particle whatever of the penalty is inflicted because he refused to sue for pardon. And yet, if he had sued for pardon, every particle of the penalty would have been remitted. So it is with the sinner in his relation to the law of God. If he despises the offer of pardon and shows his disregard by a refusal to take the steps necessary to receive the pardon, then the curse of the law, death, is allowed to fall upon him. But refusing to receive the pardon is not a sin. God invites men to receive pardon, but he has no law to compel them to be pardoned. The murderer who has been offered pardon and has rejected it is no more guilty than any other man who has committed the same crime, but who has not been offered a pardon. I do not know as this can be made any clearer, and I cannot see that it needs to be. The sum of it all is simply this, sin, is the transgression of the moral law and the violation of no other law, for the moral law covers all duty. There is a curse attached to the violation of the law, and that curse is death, for the wages of sin is death. But there is provision for the pardon of those who exercise faith in Christ, and this faith is indicated by a performance of certain rites. Before Christ, it was by the offering of the sacrifices. Since Christ, it is by baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those who have real faith will indicate it in the prescribed manner and will escape the penalty. Those who have not faith will receive the penalty. This is exactly what Christ meant when he himself said to Nicodemus, For God has sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3, 6, 17 and 18. I marvel how you can read Galatians 3, 11 and 12 and imagine that the word law in those verses has the slightest reference to the ceremonial law. I quote them. But that no man be made is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. 
for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. It does not seem as though any comment could be more evident, uh, make more evident the truth that the moral law alone is here referred to. You cannot escape this conclusion by saying that the statement that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God applies with equal force to any law, and that therefore this may apply to the ceremonial law as well as to the moral. The question is not what law may be referred to, but what law is referred to. The law here referred to is a law of which it is said, the man that doeth them shall live in them. Now, this is emphatically true of the moral law. It is equivalent to Romans 2.13. The doers of the law shall be justified. The sad fact that there are no doers of the law does not destroy the truth that the doers of the law shall be justified. Perfect compliance with the moral law alone is all that God can possibly require of any creature. Such service would necessarily give eternal life. But a man might perform every item of the ceremonial law with the most rigid scrupulousness and yet be condemned. The Pharisees were strict observers of the ceremonial law, yet they were cursed. Therefore, this text cannot have the slightest reference to the ceremonial law. Okay. Again, the text says, and the law is not of faith. But the ceremonial law was not nothing else but faith. It was a matter of faith from beginning to end. It was faith that constituted all the difference between the offering of Abel and that of Cain. It was faith alone that gave to the system all the force it ever had. And this, again, is positive evidence that the ceremonial law is not referred to. It does not seem possible that argument is needed to show that Galatians 3.11 to 13 has reference to the moral law and to the moral law exclusively. Until the publication of your pamphlet, a contrary view was never put forth by Seventh-day Adventists. I really cannot believe that you would deliberately deny that the moral law is there under consideration. The limits of this review will not allow me to take up every occurrence of the word law in the book of Galatians and show its application. But I wish to ask one question. Is it reasonable to suppose that the apostle would use the words the law in one place and then a few verses later, without any change in his subject or anything to indicate a change, use the same words again? And in the two places have reference to two entirely distinct laws. You yourself say that it is not. If it were true that the apostle wrote in so indefinite, ma indefinite a manner as that, using the term the law in one verse with reference to the moral law, and in the next verse with reference to the ceremonial law, then nobody could understand his writings unless he had the same degree of inspiration that the apostle had, which I think is actually kind of true. Anyway, I turn again to your book, page 39, and read the following. If these Galatians, if these Galatians were going to reestablish the whole Jewish system, which be the, would be the logical result of their action in adopting circumcision, they must thereby bring themselves under a curse. In the same paragraph, you say that the statement, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them, applies to the ceremonial law, and that the Galatians were bringing themselves under this curse because they were going to reestablish the whole Jewish system. I cannot see logic in that. If it were true, it would be a case of you'll be damned if you do, and you'll be damned if you don't. I pass to your argument on Galatians 3, verse 17 and 19. As on this, you say, this law was given 430 years after the promise to Abraham. Could it therefore be the same as my commandments, my statutes and my laws, which Abraham kept? Genesis 26, 5. They were evidently the moral law. Hence, this is not. So, so this is what it, Butler was arguing, which I think is pretty bizarre. We know that the law that's being referred to is the law given on Mount Sinai. Anyway, this is an argument that proves too much. It is a reversal of the Campbellite view that the moral law had no existence before it was given upon Mount Sinai. Your argument claims that the moral law was not given upon Mount Sinai because it existed in the days of Abraham. But it is a fact that God spoke some law from Mount Sinai and that this event was 430 years later after the promise to Abraham. Therefore, your statement that the law given 430 years after the time of Abraham 
the time of Abraham kept the moral law, uh, after the time should be the time Abraham kept the moral law, amounts to the assertion that the law given upon Mount Sinai was not the moral law. Your argument also, if valid, would prove that the law referred to is not the ceremonial law either, because Abraham had that in substance. Yet circumcision, which you say stands for the whole ceremonial law, and he had sacrifices. I think that when you revise your book, that argument at least will have to be left out. You next say the law was added because of transgressions. The original word signifies to pass by or over, to transgress or violate. This law then had been added because some other law had been passed by, transgressed or violated. It was not added for its, to itself because itself had been violated. This would be absurd if applied to the moral law. For none of us claims, right, this is Butler still. For none of us claim that there was any more of a moral law really in existence after the Ten Commandments were spoken than there had been before. They all existed before, though Israel may have been ignorant of portions of them. Now, this is a pretty bizarre argument. I'm not really sure. See, I, I wonder about this sometimes. You know, how Butler could take the position that he does. And, and what it reminds me of is a flat earther or, you know, Wednesday crucifixion theorist where they come with one idea and everything is bent to support that one argument, even when it's very obvious that what you're saying makes no sense. Okay. So Wagner goes on to respond to Butler's statement. It seems as though your principal argument is a play upon words. It is not enough to say that a thing is absurd in order to controvert it. Some things may seem absurd to one person, which appear very reasonable to another. Paul says that the preaching of the cross is to some people foolishness or absurd. And I've often heard people ridicule the idea that the death of one person could atone for the sins of another. They call such an idea absurd. Yet, to you and me, it is perfectly consistent with reason. So when you say that it is absurd to apply the term added to the moral law, you should substantiate your assertion by proof in order to have it of any value. You say it could not properly be said that the moral law was appointed 430 years after Abraham when we see that it existed and he fully kept it at that time. This argument has been already noticed, or noticed already, but I will note it a little further. If the law here referred to means the ceremonial law and your argument just quoted is valid, then it precludes the possibility of there being any ceremonial law in the time of Abraham. But Abraham had the essential parts of the ceremonial law, although that law had not been formally given. If you deny that Abraham has the ceremonial law and insist that that law was not given until 430 years later after his time, then I would like to ask what remedial system was there before the exodus? You say that the ceremonial law was added because of transgressions. That is a remedial system. Then why was it not added as soon as the transgression was committed instead of 2,500 years later? I claim, I claim that the remedial system entered immediately after the fall. And for proof, I cite you to the offering of Abel. Your argument would put off the remedial system until the exode. You may say that at that time, the ceremonial law was given more formally and circumstantially than before. Very good. But if that argument will apply to the ceremonial law, as it undeniably will, why will it not apply equally to the moral law? You cannot deny that the moral law was given at Sinai, although it had been known since the creation. Why was it given then? Because it had never been formally announced. So far as we know, no copy of it had ever been written. And the great mass of the people were almost totally ignorant in regard to it. You yourself say that Israel may have been ignorant in regard to it. You, your, um, you yourself say that Israel may have been ignorant in, of portions of the moral law. And this is undoubtedly true. And there is abundant reason why it should have been given at that time because of transgressions. If the people had known and obeyed the law, there would have been no necessity for its promulgation at Sinai. But because they were ignorant of its requirements and had transgressed it, it was necessary that it should be given as it was. 
But you say that it is not proper to apply the term added to the moral law. The Bible itself must decide that matter. In the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses rehearses the children of Israel, the circumstances of the giving of the law, verses 5 to 21, contain the substance of the Ten Commandments. And of these, Moses says in the 22nd verse, these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire of the cloud, and of thick darkness with a great voice, and he added no more. The term added in this verse is in the Septuagint exactly the same as that rendered added in Galatians 3.19. He's just comparing the Greek uh, uh, Old Testament to Galatians 3.19, Greek New Testament. The Hebrew word is the same that is rendered add in Genesis 3.30.24, that it had unmistakable reference to Deuteronomy 5.22 to the moral law. And to that alone, no one can deny. I care not whether you render it added, spoken, or promulgated, it makes no difference. In Hebrew 12, verse 18 and 19, we have an unmistakable reference to the voice of God speaking the law from Sinai and the request of the people that God should not speak to them anymore. In the words which voice they, uh, they that, in the words which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Here the word rendered spoken is the same as that rendered added in Galatians 3.19 and Deuteronomy 5.22. If we choose, we might render it. They entreated that the word should not be added to them anymore. And then we would have a uniform rendering. Or we might render it uniformly spoken. And then we would read in Deuteronomy that the Lord spoke all those words in the mount and out of the midst of the fire, etc., with a great voice. And he spoke no more. And this would be the exact truth and a good rendering. And likewise, for uniformity, we might justly render Galatians 5.19. It was spoken because of transgression. Or we might take the word in Deuteronomy in Deuteronomy 5.22 in the same sense in which it is used in Genesis 30.24. And the same idea would appear. When Rachel said, God shall add to me another son, it was the same as though she had said, God will give me another son. So the meaning of Deuteronomy 5.22 is that after the Lord had given them commandments recorded in the preceding verses, he gave them no more. It seems to me very reasonable to apply the term added to the moral law. And whether it is reasonable or not, I've certainly quotes, uh, I, or not, I have certainly quoted two texts besides Galatians 3.19, which apply it to it so. But you cannot find in the Bible a single instance of the use of the word added as applied to the ceremonial law to substantiate your view on Galatians 3.19. Okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, we're going to come back to this because I'm tired. But, um, you know, what do we think about what's going on so far? I mean, this is a little bit dry. I mean, it's it's good. But the main point is they are arguing about this issue of the law in Galatians. And Butler is using arguments that really don't make sense. And Wagner's using arguments that make sense. He's using good biblical examples to show that this is the, this law is the moral law in Galatians. Now, it's going to have implications, of course. That's going to be the more interesting part of it. Um, <clears throat> so, so there's some very good things that he said here. There's still more that's got to be said. Um, any thoughts before we close with prayer or questions? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today and for the Sabbath. I pray for a blessing for each person. Help us to rejoice in your salvation, to experience your peace, and to trust in Christ for his righteousness, that he may live in us and reveal his character. Be with us um, throughout the Sabbath, the studies tomorrow morning. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you can do your work upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.